Today we're going to be reviewing the Toyota Prius Hybrid. Now while most car reviewers would complain about how slow the Prius is or the demographic of people who drive these, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this Prius to see what's inside and how it works. Now we're going to start under the hood where we have Toyota's 2ZR FXE engine. Now this is a 1.8 liter 4 cylinder engine situated transversely for front wheel drive. Now underneath this power inverter here it's made it to an eCVT which is a dual motor electronic transmission. Now also under the hood we've got a conventional 12 volt battery located over here as well as your ECU fuse box and a couple of coolant reservoirs off to the side. Now we're going to start by taking a look at the air intake system on the Toyota Prius. You've got this tiny little duct here which is going to bring in cool air from the front of the vehicle and send it down to this small little tube here which ultimately is going to go to the air box where it's going to get filtered out. That'll then pass through this mass airflow sensor and then be sent directly into the throttle body down into the air intake plenum at the top here before going down into the engine head. Now accessing the air filter on the Toyota Prius is pretty straightforward. Just got to remove some tabs here, unlock it, and remove this small little air filter. It's so cute, eh? Now this is smaller than even the cabin air filter. Now with the air intake out of the way, we have clear access to the throttle body, which is a standard drive-by wire unit. That's going to feed into this plastic intake plenum and then into the engine head over here. Now the fuel system on the Prius is pretty straightforward. You've just got four port fuel injectors here that sit right on top of the engine. There's no direct injection or high pressure fuel pumps here and it directs fuel directly down onto the intake valve so you don't have to worry about carbon buildup. Now the ignition system comprises of these four coil packs that sit on top of the spark plugs so changing them out should be pretty straightforward. Now the valve cover on the Prius is made of a plastic like material and this does take 0W16 weight oil which is going to be pretty fuel saving and you've got your engine oil dipstick right here easy to access. Now taking a look at the underbody of the Prius you've got the engine over here on the passenger side with its oil pad and the transmission over here on the driver's side. Now taking a look at the engine from underneath here we've got a stamped steel oil pan which bolts to the aluminum upper oil pan. Now over here we've got a traditional spin on style filter. It's not the typical cartridge filter that you find in many modern Toyotas that you need a special tool for. Now taking a look over on the passenger side of this engine here, underneath this cover you actually have dual overhead cams. There's the intake cam on the front and the exhaust cam a little bit down at the back. Now this is driven by a timing chain so you don't have to worry about replacing it every so often. The 2ZR FXE is a very basic version of this engine. It uses the Atkinson cycle which means that only the intake side gets a variable valve timing and you can see the variable valve timing solenoid right on the top here. Now down on the front of the engine you can see here is the harmonic balancer. Now normally you would have a belt system set up on this side here for the serpentine accessories but because this is a hybrid it actually doesn't really have much accessories. You've got the water pump located over here and this big area here is where an alternator would be but because you've got a hybrid set up the generator acts as the alternator to charge the batteries. Now the water pump itself is not going to be belt driven because this is a hybrid and when you're in EV mode this is actually going to be electrically driven so that it can cool off the engine or warm up the cabin while the engine is still off. Now further down from that is the AC compressor located down over here. Once again it's not belt driven because when you're in hybrid mode you will have the engine off. It's actually an electrically driven scroll type AC compressor. Now if you want to see what a hybrid compressor looks like inside I do have another teardown video linked above. Now luckily accessing that AC compressor if you do have to service it is pretty straightforward. Here's your high voltage cable here that feeds the electric motor inside of here from the hybrid system. Now you don't have to remove any of the front end components. It's fairly accessible once you get all these hoses out of the way. Now from underneath here you can see the harmonic balancer. There's no belts attached to it. And then down at the front here is the AC compressor. Once again fairly easy to drop out and access. One thing these hybrid compressors do use ND oil and not regular PAG oil. So when you're servicing you got to make sure you use the right oil. I find it interesting how this knock sensor is not even threaded in on the way but it's not loose. Now in terms of electronics under the hood other than a couple of extra wires around this inverter assembly going into the transmission there really isn't anything extra or complicated about this hybrid setup. Everything's pretty standard and straightforward like any normal internal combustion engine vehicle. Over here you've got the ECU which is going to control your combustion engine. You've also got this fuse box here which is nicely labeled and a conventional 12 volt battery all where you would expect it to be in any normal vehicle. There's also an auxiliary fuse box located out on the passenger side. And now we'll have a listen to the engine. <laughs> 
Now next we'll talk about this big elephant in the room here, which is the converter and inverter assembly, which takes up a huge chunk of space on top of the transmission. Now its job is to take the energy coming from the battery in high voltage form and convert it so that it can work with the electric motors down inside of the transmission. Now if you do want to find out a little bit more about hybrid systems and how they work, I do have another video linked above which you can check out. Now this high voltage inverter assembly is made of high powered components, which means that it actually has its own cooling system. So it here has its own coolant reservoir, it's got an electronic pump inside, and it's got its own dedicated radiator at the bottom of the main radiator of the vehicle. So that means when you're servicing your cooling system, there's actually two separate cooling systems to service, the one for the engine and the one for the inverter assembly. Now underneath all this plastic on the passenger side, you've got the battery pack, and on the driver's side, you've got your fuel tank. Up here, you can see the orange wire, which is your high voltage wire as it comes up to the front subframe. And just above that front subframe, you can see that orange wire running over to this side, which is where your inverter is at the top. Now the most important part of the Toyota Prius is its hybrid battery, which is located underneath the rear seat here. You can see it takes up the entire cavity along the width of the vehicle. Now this battery pack does get a little bit warm, so in order to cool it off, Toyota's put in an air duct system here, where it draws in air from this side over here, where we've got this hole. It's got its own blower motor over inside of here and the panel for it actually has its own air filter so not only do you have to service your cabin air filter but you gotta service your battery's air filter as well. Now just beside the blower motor is the kill switch for your high voltage battery in case you have to work on anything hybrid related. Now I think the transmission is one of the more unique things on Toyota hybrids and the fact that it's actually not a traditional transmission. There's no torque converter, there's no clutches, there's no relays or solenoids, there's no valve body and of course there's no cones and belts like a traditional CVT. The way it works is you've got one motor connected to the crankshaft and the second larger motor that actually drives the wheels and between them you've got a power split device which is just a planetary gear set and a gear reduction. Now that's pretty much all there is inside mechanically of this transmission. The rest of it is all taken care of by this inverter assembly. Now of course this transmission is not really serviceable from the top here. Anything you got to do to the transmission you got to remove this inverter which is kind of a big job. There is no transmission dipstick however to check the transmission fluid. You do have to do that from the fill and check ports down below. Now the transmission does have its own cooler. You can see it just off the front here with these coolant lines as it hooks up to the transmission at the front. Now the, of course the advantage to such a simple transmission is reliability. A lot of these older Priuses have known to have gone many hundreds of thousands of miles without any need for engine or transmission transmission work. Now from underneath here you can see the transmission's got a fill plug up here by the CV shaft and a drain plug down here. So you'd basically drain it and fill it up until it overflows just like a differential. Now checking the transmission fluid level actually doesn't really require dipstick because you just fill it up until the top. That's because there's no additional components in here that take transmission fluid. When you drain it, all of it drains out. There's no valve body or torque converter leaving excess transmission fluid inside. And for the transmission, we got another look at the transmission cooler. That's actually connected to the inverter cooling circuit, which is driven off of this water pump over here. Now just beside the transmission cooler is your gear selector. It's an electronic motor. Motor, it's going to engage and disengage the parking pole depending on what gear you select on the dashboard. Now once the electric motors in the transmission have already determined the vehicle speed, it's going to send power out to a differential just like a regular car here and then out to the CV axis to the front wheels. Now in the all-wheel drive models there is no transfer case that goes to the back and that's because at the back there there's a separate electric motor driving the rear wheels. Now the Prius comes with hubcaps although you've got an alloy wheel underneath. Now taking a look at the front suspension of the Toyota Prius, you've got a McPherson strut front suspension that bolts up to a steel steering knuckle. And at the bottom here you've got your sway bar that goes over to the other side and this really long slender link that attaches to the strut. Now at the bottom here you've got a stamp steel lower control arm as well as your inner and outer tie rods that are connected to your knuckle. Now taking a look from down below here you've got this ball joint that's bolted onto the control arm which should be pretty easy to replace separately and it also bolts into the knuckle through that castle nut over there. Now up at the top here you've got one of three bolts here that hold in the bearing so you don't need a press in order to change it out, you just unbolt it from this knuckle. Now changing the control arms aren't too difficult once you can access the bolt for this bushing at the front here and the rear one here is pretty easy to access from the bottom and you can change it out. Now the front subframe is made of stamped steel on this car, there's not much use of aluminum. You'd think so because it's a hybrid and they'd probably want to lightweight things. However, they do stop the subframe right at the front here. The subframe doesn't really continue to the front. They have this non-structural brace here to help keep up some of the underbody plastics. Now one thing I do appreciate is that all the front end here 
including the radiator support from the top all the way to the sides and down at the bottom here is all made of steel it's not made of plastic which will crumple at any small impact and from underneath here that lower control arm looks like swiss cheese now overall though i think a mcpherson strut suspension does suit the idea of an economy car such as the toyota prius although i do wish they did use a lot more upgraded materials such as aluminum for lighter weight and corrosion resistance especially this being such an expensive vehicle now looking at the rear suspension of the toyota prius this is the OG when it comes to the TNGA platform. This is the first vehicle that came out with this design. So it's gonna look like any other Toyota vehicle that's front wheel drive from recent history. You've got an independent rear suspension here with this upper control arm and you've got a rear lower control arm here. Then at the front here, you've got this really long trailing arm that connects to the knuckle as well as this front lower control arm here that connects back to the subframe. Now the stabilizer bar connects over here at the subframe from the bushing and runs down underneath to this little stabilizer bar link which connects to the trailing arm. Now over here you've got your shock absorber which bolts to the body and then to this bolt over here which goes into the steering knuckle. Now the knuckle itself is made of steel and not aluminum. Now if you do have to replace bushings on the back here, luckily some of the components here such as this rear lower arm is pretty easy to access. Now that front lower arm is also fairly easy to access here as well as this trailing arm which bolts to the body. However, one thing I really don't like about this platform is in order to do an upper control arm, you have to drop the entire subframe which means that you're gonna have to drop the exhaust and the gas tank and everything else that's attached to it because this bolt is so difficult to access. It's already buried up inside of the body. So in case you do hit a pothole or a curb and you bend this guy or the bushings just wear out, good luck replacing this because it's a big job. Now here's another look at the rear suspension from underneath. Here you can see the front lower control arm a little bit more clearly where it bolts up to the knuckle over there and the subframe over here. Pretty much the only adjustment here is a cam and caster adjustment bolt at the back of the rear controller. Now looking from the behind the knuckle, you can see the four bolts where the bearing would bolt up to, so you don't need a press if you have to change it up. Now overall, having this independent rear multi-link suspension is actually pretty good for an economy class of vehicle. It'll definitely give you better handling to a vehicle that arguably doesn't really need it. However, come time to do maintenance, it is gonna be a little bit more expensive to maintain. Now the rear subframe is pretty straightforward, just a stamped steel design. You can see you've got a jack point here, although it is kind of off-centered. Over here you can also see you've got the fuel tank, which is made of plastic. Now just above the fuel tank is your EVAP canister located over here. Now this setup would obviously be much different if you have the E all-wheel drive system, which integrates an electric motor and a small transaxle that'll go out to each wheel to power the rear wheel. Now taking a look at the cooling system on the Toyota Prius, at least for the engine side, you can see here you have your coolant reservoir as well as a radiator cap, which has been relocated off of the radiator and onto the coolant expansion tank. Now down at the front here you do have the radiator but unfortunately if you do have to replace it you have to remove the entire front half of this vehicle including the headlights and the bumper and then also this radiator support in order to lift the assembly out and here's a look at the dual radiator fans from behind once again this does get replaced as an assembly with the radiator now down below there you can see the separate hoses that are going to go to the inverters cooling assembly which is a completely separate circuit from the one that feeds the engine finally also coming off of one of the radiator hoses here is your traditional thermostat assembly located in this plastic housing and that plugs directly into the water pump now the water pump is electrically driven and luckily replacing it isn't too difficult you just have to remove this passenger side mount and maybe jack the engine up a little bit so you got enough clearance to pull it out also part of the cooling system are these active grill shutters which are going to close at high speed for better aerodynamics and open at lower speeds for better cooling now the inverter has its own radiator which is in the lower half over here that's why you've got two petcock valves one over there for the regular radiator and and the one at the bottom here for the inverter radiator. Now one thing I don't like about the cab forward design of the Prius is that the windshield cowl extends over half of the engine. So if you gotta do any work back there, you gotta remove the wipers and also this cowl here so that you can access simple things like ignition coils, any of the exhaust back there, even refilling brake fluid or removing the struts. It does, however, make a nice little holder for your tools and bolts. Well, it looks like they did make a little doorway so you can check on your brake fluid, so at least there's that. Now taking a look at the brake setup on the Prius, things are a little unique because this is a hybrid. So you have an electronically actuated brake booster, which is very difficult to see, but it's basically that shiny thing that's underneath this brake reservoir on the driver's side. Now coming over to the passenger side, we've got this over here. This big shiny cylinder is actually the brake pump which is gonna provide pressure over to that master cylinder. And then just behind it, we have the ABS actuator, which is gonna be your traction stability control and any autonomous braking features. Now, as with all hybrids, the brakes do have to work when both in EV mode 
and when the engine is running. So that's why you can't just have a traditional vacuum powered booster. Now the other challenge is you've also got to blend traditional disc brakes with the regenerative braking inside of the transmission. And here's a clear shot of the ABS actuator and brake pump from down below here just above the CV shaft. Now I think it's pretty cool how they've integrated the front radar sensor into the actual emblem itself. Now taking a look at the front brake setup on the Prius, you've got a single piston floating caliper on a ventilated disc rotor. Now this rotor here actually looks kind of small compared to the heat shield that's behind it. Maybe it could probably use a brake upgrade. But that being said, you probably don't need to change these brakes or service them too often because of the regenerative braking aspect of the hybrid system. So you don't really put that much stress on these brakes ultimately. Now taking a look at the rear brakes on the Toyota Prius, at least they give you disc brakes with this floating caliper design compared to say drum brakes for most economy cars. And one thing I noticed is the rotor is really thin and it's not ventilated or anything. I wonder how long that's going to last. Now what's really interesting is that they're still using manual parking brakes on these newer vehicles. You expect with the hybrid being way ahead of its time that it would use electric parking brakes, but they're still using cable operated brakes. Now taking a look at the exhaust setup on the Prius, there's nothing you can really see from back here, but the exhaust manifold hangs off the back of the engine to a catalytic converter. Now what's also interesting is this engine has EGR, where you've got a little bit of the exhaust that's going to recirculate back around through this EGR cooler located down here, and then this here, the EGR valve, and is then going to be piped back into the air intake over here to get recirculated and burned. Now coming off of the first catalytic converter here, you can see that pipe that's going to go up to feed the EGR system. Now from underneath here, it's much easier to see the exhaust. You can see the integrated exhaust manifold. There's one catalytic converter over here, and then the other one just underneath this here. Now those exhaust gases are going to flow under this metal shield to the secondary catalytic converter, and then out to the back. However, in between here, you can see that there is a heat recovery device which has these two coolant lines attached to it which is going to recover heat from the exhaust after the catalytic converter. Now the exhaust is then going to flow over to that resonator and then out to the tailpipe. Now that exhaust is then going to run out through this tailpipe out to the back here where this muffler is transversely mounted. It's kind of a really thin muffler but what do you expect for a small vehicle is then going to exit out to the back over here. Now Toyota didn't really make any efforts to bring it out past the bumper where you can see it so it's somewhat hidden. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Now the steering system on the Prius is an electric power assist with the steering motor up inside of the column above this knee airbag. Now just on top of the subframe here is the steering column which joins to this steering rack which is going to move to either side of the vehicle through the inner and outer tie rod. Now, I think it's pretty good that the Prius includes a spare tire. You'd expect it to be removed for weight reduction, especially on a hybrid vehicle, and this area to be filled up with batteries or something. Now it sounds like all of these panels underneath here are all hollow. There's nothing underneath here. I feel like it's a wasted use of space. They could have probably made some storage from under the floor. And that's a wrap on the mechanicals of the Toyota Prius Hybrid. Now overall, I think that the engine, suspension, and transmission are a very simple design, and that's balanced off with a very advanced hybrid system that's been tried and true over many years. However, besides the hybrid synergy drive system, this car is basically an economy car in terms of build quality. So I would expect for the next generation Prius, Toyota is going to make a lot of upgrades to make this more premium feeling and have a lot more advanced features. Now you tell me in the comment section down below, what do you think of Toyota's hybrid systems and their place in the marketplace today? Now make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe for more videos just like this one.